Okay, Ephesians chapter 4. I, I, was, I was really, ex, really impacted during our, our Holy Spirit conference, and I can't wait to get us, get back and soak in some of the sounds. They will be up online in our website sometime in the begin, middle of the week. We also, we've been shifting. Our whole media team has enlarged its uh, capacities, with cameras and inclusion, and it's now on YouTube. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, Jubilee Church, and then you'll get updates. We've even got some of the songs now getting up there, so you can plug in and listen to the, your, to the worship you were singing and just keep singing it. So, uh, but be patient with us because we've got, there's new technical details to get all that functioning smooth like it was. But it will be up, all the services, Lord willing, by middle of the week. It'll be up on YouTube first, and then it'll get on, back onto our website on demand. Okay, so I'm going to pray. Dear Father, oh, I would ask that you would, by your Holy Spirit, come to each one of us in our life, wherever we are, however we are, whatever's happening. And before service is completed, pour the love of God into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. That whatever obstacle, whatever separation we might feel, or accusation we might be warding, pushing away, or condemnation we feel we're having to live out, whatever crises, you would overwhelm it. You would overwhelm us. You would unlock us and you would make it all good because love is that way it drives out fear and makes us complete we receive your love before we can do anything or access it in truth we ask you holy spirit who pours out love into our heart by the, by yourself to do so even even now and especially in the areas where we are in a deficit where we feel alone, where we feel separated, where we feel frightened, may you come with love, greater love than we've ever experienced to this day, I pray, for each of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Wouldn't you like to just receive more love than you've ever received before? Yeah, I would. I, I'm in. I'm in. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, in verse uh, 11, 11. I'm just going to start where I ended and go on because I want to... I want, to, I want to talk about maybe a new thought to some of us, but I think it's very biblical and it will be very freeing. starts off by, he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. We call that the fivefold ministry for the equipping of the saints. That's all of us, me included. We're all saints. If we believe in the Lord Jesus, we've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. We're saints. For the work of ministry, we all have a job that will, will cause the body to grow up. That's why it says, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. All ministry that God gives us in, amongst each other, with each other, is to build up his body. The beautiful bride of Jesus Christ, to whom he is excited and looks to us as a glorious church. Even before we see ourselves glorious. Then he goes on and says, till we all come to the unity of the faith. Faith, there's one faith that's been given, one Lord, there's one spirit, there's one body, there's one hope of our calling, there's one God and Father of all who is over us, through us, and in us. So we're growing into one, into the, into the unity of the faith. That's what jo joins us in our hearts, in our belief in Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to say, to a perfect man, which is the word matured, or really best word would be a complete man, made complete, just whole. Not, not that you and, you've got all tight and all freaked out about how to live and make sure we don't do anything wrong. That's not at all perfect. It's very comfortable in who you are because you're in Christ and Christ has accepted you and you're accepted, and love has filled you, and it just gets really good. That's where we're growing. That's where we're all headed to. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So each of us 
individually members one of another of his body, one day all of us will be just like really, really working, firing all cylinders, full of joy and peace, hope and victory and triumph. And because of that, there will be a bride for, the, for Christ. There will be a body that is the fullness of him who fills all in all. There will be a house for him to worship in the midst of living stones. It will be a big family. He's our elder brother, but we'll look like Jesus. We'll feel like Jesus. We will not be separate from Jesus. We'll be dependent completely on Jesus. That's what will make us so full of life because we won't be trying to do it ourselves and the fear factors and separation and oh no and oh me all that will just kind of give way to oh you and how glorious you are and you're just going to be so big and make your marriage better your family better your children better your singlehood better every part of life will just go then he jumps and he says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting that that's a mouthful <laughs> and <clears throat> we're taking the time with your concordance on your phone that's why God gave us smartphones so we could have the Bible on our phone and concordance and just touch each of those words you'd be surprised it's the picture is that what's happening is we're still eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and not eating the tree of life we're still choosing to learn something special Special knowledge. You know. Instead of just receiving the fullness of everything is in Christ. And in Christ, love is how he, we know one another. Instead of, and this is one of the profound things of last week. God always meets me on the, in the conference. And he started talking, he has been talking, but he just really kind of put a charge. He said, I will now cause my body to have faith in what I accomplished in my son in the body of Christ. You accept what my son has accomplished, now you'll begin to accept what, my, what I'm accomplishing in my church. Your faith will rise to expect this. So I got excited. Because otherwise we just run around and we, we lose our place all the time and we're chewing off that tree of knowledge of good and evil. And Self-righteousness is the enemy of love. Because love covers the multitude of sins. Self-righteousness is always trying to make sure self is right, so it's law-based, and it's always wanting to separate from whatever will contaminate it, and so it's a separator when it isn't an includer. And love is this like capacity to include. So he says, but speaking the truth inside of love, which way you pronounce it, may grow up in all things into him who is the head. So if we take verse 13 again, and we take out the, we're getting free from all of this need to know and puffing up that it creates and arrogance and separation. Once we get that kind of free because we grow up into him who is the fullness, then you can hear the charge. So I'm going to read verse 13. We'll skip verse 14 because it's going to one day not be a problem for any of us. And we'll go right into verse 15. So till we all come to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 15. But, or you wouldn't even have to have the but now, you're just speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Christ is the head, and we are growing up into him in all things, not just church, family, neighborhoods, business, economics, friendship, everything, anything that concerns us is all coming back to God as we grow up in all these things into him. So the point reached now becomes the place from which life flows. Verse 16, from we know we grew up into the head. We're growing up into the head from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every part joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes the growth of the body for itself in love. That's another mouthpiece full. 
Basically, if you ever feel like you're getting squeezed into a can of sardines, you're probably being led by the Spirit. Because the Spirit is leading us closer and closer and closer together with less and less space between each other and more and more acceptance. And the only way that will happen is because love will begin to become the, the over, overarching fruit of the Spirit and the experience of the believer and it'll begin to flow. But if you're like me, you've probably had some negative experience with trying to love the church. Anybody been traumatized by the church? Anybody been traumatized? Yeah, right, we've all, well, the rest of you are so great. Well, we've skipped the whole thing, and you don't need to know about that. You're <clears throat> love does not originate from me. I do not have love. I cannot love. I can be loved, and in being loved, then I can allow that love to flow out of me. But if I cease being loved, I stop loving. Or worse, I shift from a flow of life from the head and I start trying to replicate it with my soul. I try to keep the emotions there. I try to keep the sentiment there. I try to keep the decision to love and I try to be good. But before long, my soul is the source that I'm trying to pull love out of. And that, I don't know about you, have you ever loved out of your soul? It's just like, yuck. You know, it's like best, the best kind of soulish love is like, hey, I'm going to, we're going to be friends, best friends forever, right? I'm going to, you know, we're going to share everything. You know, we get married. I'm going to just be wonderful to you. You're going to be wonderful to me. And I'm going to be more wonderful to you. And you're going to be more wonderful to me. And, oh, I can't wait. It's going to be so good. But sooner or later, your soul goes, you're not as wonderful as I am. <laughs> you know, I mean, I thought, you know, I thought this was going to be a wonderful gift. And I'm just not feeling it. I'm not feeling the wonderful. And then it goes from the giving to the accusing. And then the separating. And because there's only one who is worthy of our love, that is Jesus Christ. And there's only one to whom love is found in, and that is Jesus Christ. So you have to keep him first. If you've never been married... Best advice I've ever told anyone is find someone that loves Jesus more than they love you. They're worth, you could maybe marry them. It'll still be hard, but <laughs> because we, we forget who we are most of the time. We get, we get our life. I'm going to show a picture. If I grow up into him who is the head and in him all things consist and all things are, whatever I need is in Christ. Do you need a marriage? You're, it's in Christ. Do you need money? He's in, it's in Christ. Do you need hope, joy, healing, deliverance? It's found in Christ. Is there anything that's hindering your life from going forward? It's overcome in Christ. Is there anyone who's destroying your life? They're, over, they're overdone. They're undone in Christ. Christ is greater than everything. We can say Christ is greater than this, greater than that. Jesus Christ is Lord. So when we grow up into him, then from there, we receive what we need, and that abundance of love starts to flow outward, which is why the, the body starts to grow up. It starts to grow up inside of love. In the scripture, you will not find any place that you have been, or I have been, or any of us are given the right to demand love. Yet so often we, we run around going, love me, love me. Second advice to those who want to get married. Don't be needy. There's nobody, you're not attractive if you're going around going, please love me, please love me, please love me. I want to be loved. I just want to be loved. Please love me. People going, whoa, whoa. No, you, what's most attractive is somebody who's so in love with Jesus and being so loved by Jesus, they're, they're oblivious to everybody else. Now, having said that, that puts the the responsibility to me to find the love that I need in Jesus. Because, do you know what? We were created as in the creative and redemption even more so. We were created to be loved and dependent on receiving love to awaken to our identity. We need conversation. We need connection. We need validation. We need affirmation. But the one and only who really can unlock our identity is Jesus Christ. And so if, when, you, when we start to understand that, 
then we're, we're like growing up in him. We have a, our hand in heaven, and we can release what we're receiving into earth. But as long as that connection stays there, then it, there, there's, no, there's no limitation to how much the love of God can grow in us. So I want to take us to Romans 8. We'll be in this thought for a while now, because I really believe God is unlocking a vision for love. The love of Jesus awakened. But Romans 8, uh, there are three things that I found in my life that's all throughout Scripture, and I'll unpack it more on, on Wednesday. There are three things that we find ourselves a deficit in and find the resource from ex when we experience it in Christ, it's transforming. It's, it literally can change wherever we are. And it's justification, which is a big word to say, you're innocent. You're no longer guilty. You're no longer accusable. You're, you're now accepted in the beloved. There is glorification, which is a future that we have, a hope that we anticipate, growing up to be like Christ, uh, anticipation of promises being fulfilled, the hope that comes through that. And then there is love that unites us to God. I, I literally think it may indeed be just pure glory, the glory of God. Jesus says in John 17, Father, I want them to see the glory that I've had with you from the beginning, that they might be one, that they might know the love that we've had forever. The two things Jesus asked was that we would know his glory and we would know his love. So Romans 8, in the, uh, verse 28, familiar. The problem... Uh, of, of living this truth out is we have an opposite we have an uh, we have an opponent Satan our flesh and its funkiness the world and its allurement and and conflicts of emotions and accusation and it gets it just would rattle us and stuff happens bad stuff happens not what we planned happens but when we return ourselves to God and really basically starts with daily prayer, giving God some quality, perfect, purposeful time to say, I want to experience who you are in my own heart. I don't, I don't want to be told who you are. I want to know who you are. I want you to tell me who you are. I want you to be who you are to me. And in an intensity, intentionality. When that begins to happen, God can come in and say, hey, let me take your life as you see it, and let me redefine your life as I see it. Let me take your awful, make it awesome. I want your mess, because it's going to become your message. I want your funk, we're going to make it fun. We're going we're to take the weird and make it wonderful. I'm going to take the ashes, rearrange the letters, they'll be beautiful. Take the depression you're carrying in your life, I'm going to turn it into a garment of praise. I'm going to take your shame and I'm going to bring it a double honor. And, and this, is, this is how he looks at us. I know whenever I, I'm aware of that, I, I am happy for my stuff that I can give him. Because I know I'm not trying to perfect me and then come to him. I'm actually, he's looking for my junk. My stuff that I haven't been able to solve. He's wanting it. He's... he's excited about what he's going to do with me. So he says, we know that all things work together for good. All things are being worked into good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So when we begin our journey, opposition meets us. Faith is, you know, we have childlike hope that thinks, oh, it's all going to go perfect, and it doesn't, and we put our life somewhere, and it turns out south and not where we wanted it to be and it just seems like it's worse sometimes for believers because they have this expectancy that now that God's on my side everything's going to work right but God's a liberator from our flesh and our soul and all the stuff that we carry into this relationship so he says hey we've got time and the testing will build faith and patience and we're just going to get there but it's that connection that says everything's going to be okay I see you. I know you. I'll find you. 
I will bring you into your future. It's all going to be all right. And when you feel that, you can get up and face the next day. You can do whatever you have to do because it's going to be okay. And hope comes alive. Then he goes and he makes this statement. It's just huge. For whom he foreknew. Knew. Foreknew. That means pre-knew us before we were knew ourselves. Before we were conceived. Before, for him, before he foreknew. He predestined. That means he set our boundaries, our timing of coming into the earth. There's no, so there's, we, were, we were predetermined when we would be born with boundaries of when we would come to find God because we were predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And how did that happen? That he might be the firstborn among many brethren? It happened because those he predestined, he also called. So at some point in time, you and your heart, of, I and my heart of heart, and you and our heart of heart, you hear the Lord call you. Follow me. I am a father. I provided my son. Jesus is his name. Receive him. His resurrection is your justification. What he accomplished at the cross for your sins was now eradicated in his resurrection. Receive him. And, we go, oh. and there we are. Now we're born again. We were called. Foreknown, predestined, called. You think, okay, that's great. Now let's go. He goes, it gets better. He says that those he called, these he justified. Really important. Too many of us don't, don't let this set on us. Justification was not done by our actions or our efforts. It was done by Christ's action and God's declaration. And it cannot come any other way. And then he goes on, he says, and these he justified, he also glorified. Good news. All past tense, right? It's, there's, no, there's no present tense. I guess it would be because it's already been done. And yes, there are things that are going to yet to be seen. So there's, therefore, we have hope in a lot of these areas of, of glorification. But the fact of the matter is, Papa has got a wedding planned for his son. And we are the bride. And his son gave himself so he could have us. And now he's washing us with the water of his word so that he can present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. And he will have what he set in motion. And that's why whenever we step into the presence, God quickly recalibrates us to truth so we can agree again and not let the circumstances of life drag us down. Now watch, this is so beautiful. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? May that truth just penetrate our spirit today. May it wash my mind so I can, literally it means if God is over us, who can pull us down? If God is holding us in his, his overage, over place, over, over us, then nothing can pull us down. He who did not spare his own son. Father's commitment to us, his son. But delivered him up for us, instead of us, over us. Made him to take our wrath and our wrap over us. How shall he not with him? This is the part of, in, of inheritance that we're all growing into. The with Christ. There are, we are in Christ. Christ is over us. We approach God through Christ and we receive all glorification and future benefits with him. That way we will grow up like him in maturity and we will have authority. But, but it's all in Christ, Christ over us, through Christ, and this benefit that we get with Christ. So he says, how will he not with him freely give us all things? And the word freely, give us all things, has the idea of giving and forgiving. You can't mess up your inheritance. You can't spend it, lose it, and never return. Because God keeps it in a trust fund. And upon your awakening to, wow, I just wasted my father's inheritance. I think I'm going to go home and see if I could be a servant. He's there ready to receive you as a son and elevate you back to your place. Isn't that, isn't that amazing that God would just receive us every day? That makes prayer just so exciting because I can come back to who I am even though I lost who I was 
during the, the day before. There he is affirming me. So here's what he does. And these are the three things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Charge is the word, we get the word accusation. Have you ever felt accusation over you? Right? You're in your thoughts, other people speaking, the, the, the sense of, oh no, uh, you're not good enough, you, you, you messed up too many times, it doesn't matter, you'll never get out of where you are. Just that accusation. Here, God says, or Paul says in Romans 8, who can bring a charge? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect, us, his sons and daughters, chosen? It is God who justifies. So, it's like I shared, you know, if, if God justifies me and somebody finds some dirt on me, he's not going to listen because everything was dealt with at the cross and the resurrection. I have now been justified. So, but it's a practice. It's a practice in prayer. To practice justification in prayer is something like this. Heavenly Father, I want to come to you and be in your presence through Jesus Christ. I am accepted in the beloved. I am justified. I'm just as if I never sinned. I'm going to enjoy your company because you accept me in Jesus and I'm going to receive freedom. There is no accusation. When you practice approaching Jesus, Father, through Jesus Christ, you learn that it wasn't how good a day you had or how bad a day you had that determines whether you're welcomed. It's all about Jesus. Just his name, confidence in what he accomplished, appropriating it again. And no matter how far off you took, went off the gold standard the day before, or two hours before, you can just return right into that place. And that's how you get free from sin, in case you didn't want, ever wondered. It's not by trying to stop doing bad things. It's just start staring on the good one. Looking and beholding the beautiful, glorified Christ who's redeemed us. Next thing you know, we're going, oh, that stuff's a distraction. What a waste of time, man. I don't need that. And if one day you get weak and you stumble back into your same old pool of cess. Yeah, exactly. You just say, well, Jesus, I'm not staying here. And I'm so glad I can come back into you. And I'm glad there's a shower on the way in. Wash me. Cleanse me. It, it gets even better. Who shall... Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Accusation is when somebody levels a charge against you. Condemnation is when you're found guilty and forced to pay. It's a, it's a just judgment against you that now is being enforced. And there's some of us that are carrying around condemnation that we need to just let it go today. Because here he says, how can you be condemned? Christ already was condemned. He died. And he also is risen. And even more effectively is today he's interceding for us. Which means that he is not, he's, he's actively prayerfully intersecting our life to return us to the truth of what he's accomplished and who we are in him. That is what intercession is. He's not pleading with God. Oh God, please don't get upset at California. They just, they're just kind of a lost forsaken little girl. Please, please don't. And don't, don't remember my blood. Dad, don't be mad. How can dad be mad? Dad cannot be mad at his son, victory and triumph and confidence and intercession and calling forth the maturity of the bride, calling forth the awakening of the church. Call. And so what Jesus does is in intercession, he intersects our life. He breaks into moments. He goes, let me explain to you what really is happening. You're on the road to Emmaus, dejected, wanting to give up. I'm resurrected. You're going the opposite direction. Why don't we walk together for a little bit? Tell me your story. Then I'll tell you my story. And you choose which story you want to keep. And all the time, I don't know, every time Jesus meets me and begins to intercede and, and, and unpack, and mediate, explain, I'm just going, yeah, I'm in. But again, we can take advantage every day when you pray to say, Father, I just want to be with you today. I'm going to start in justification. 
I'm justified. No, not me. No, 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 not me. Jesus. But you see me, you see Jesus. And so I'm just going to get comfortable accepting that I'm justified because of what you did with Jesus. I am accepted in the beloved. And you use language to paint pictures, to elicit responses, to unlock emotions, to create experiences. And that's where knowing God begins to become fashioned. No, we go beyond justification. I have a future. I will be glorified. My inheritance is good. And God has promised to complete what he started. And I'm not going to be forgotten or forsaken or lost. I am on my way into glorification. And Jesus is here to make sure it happens. And so I'm going to hold that experience of the future present with you in your presence. I'm going to hold the promise of my future present in your presence. I'm going to agree with what you said in your presence and not let the circumstances of life define where I am or limit my options. My options are only limited by your word. So here we go. And you practice that. But then the third one, the third, which is, I, is going to be, when this starts unlocking, it, it, just, it just takes us out of a whole other realm because it takes us into the love realm. He simply says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Separate literally means a room between. He says, can there be space between me and the love of Christ? Can there be a space where you feel separated, where you feel disconnected, where you feel like I'm, I'm not being loved, I can't receive love? And he, then he goes on and he says, and he lists some gnarly stuff. I mean, it's kind of like, I'd just like, I'd, I'd rather just say, I love you so much, I'll make sure you have weekends at the Marriott, trips to Disneyland, snow trip once a year, surf, surf Ferrari, you know, I'm just going to make it all, just, I want you to know how much I love you. Just, but instead he says, no, my love is so real and genuine and assured and experiential. And none of these things can stop or put a space between your, my love for you. Can tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, all physical experiences we could go through. As it is written, for your sake, we're killed all day long. It's not very exciting. The sheep for slaughter brigade. It looks like we're losing, but we're winning. We are accounted as sheep for slaughter. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. To live is Christ, to die is gain. And even though none of us are ready to die tomorrow, trust me, if you do, you won't want to come back. You'll be going, woohoo, I am fulfilled. I have nothing left to do on the rock planet. So, practicing truth frees us from the fear of death that makes us slaves to our soul and protecting ourselves all the time. So this love thing, this love, this loving us to life, liberating us from ourself, is, he, he just keeps going. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. Man, now we're getting into the unseen world. We're getting into real conflicts, real battles. Shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Now here's the really good news. Justification, glorification, and love are in Christ Jesus. That's the beauty. We can't lose being justified, even if we go off and just sin our head off tonight, this afternoon. We're still justified. As soon as we wake up to that truth, we'll just return back to Jesus. And after a while, we'll go, you know, that really takes a lot of energy to do that. I just think I'll skip that today. And you look at it just like that, you know. It's, you look at it like, oh, gosh, I got dog dew on my feet. That is like, it takes a lot to get out of my shoes. I'm just, I'm just not going to watch where I walk. 
But it's by watching who you're walking after that all this happens. In Christ, I'm justified. In Christ, I'm glorified. In Christ, I am loved. I'm loved like God loves Jesus. I'm loved as much as God loves Jesus. I'm not loved a little less. I'm not loved measurably how lovable I am. He's just loving me. Which if you've ever had God start to love you when you're in a frightened state, you're just all, no, 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 I want control. He says, no, I just want to hug you. No, 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 I want control. No, I just want to hug you. Like you were saying, Sharon, this week, just, you don't have to be afraid. I love you. I won't let anything happen. I love you. I love you. Yeah, you might go through some stuff, but you'll never be separated from my love. My love will be tangible. So, for this to grow, remember the picture? Growing up into him, who is the head, Christ, in all things, everything, into him, who is the head. In him, the head, is justification, glorification, and love. And if in him, we then take advantage and say, and this is where we can personally make this a prayer this week. I want to experience the justification of Jesus Christ in my time with you until I'm convinced I'm justified. And that horrific thing that happened doesn't have effect on me anymore. And I want to be in Christ and feel the future. I want to feel the wind behind my wings lifting me. I want to have the promises of God be breathed again and the hope come alive. See, faith justifies. Glorification is attached to hope and love unites. And Lord, I want to experience love. And Romans 5.5 5 says, I pour my love into your heart to the Holy Spirit given to you. So literally, I believe we are approaching, and this is part of the Holy Spirit's coming, a love fest. I mean, just, just an overwhelming love. Because how do we overcome the evil one in Romans, Revelation 12.11? We overcame him. By the blood of the Lamb. That's justification. And the word of our testimony. That's our personal story with God in Christ. What we've heard from heaven. That's our glorification. Our future. And we don't love our life unto the death. That is the word. Suke for life or soul. Because we're afraid it's going to die. Instead we're loved to life. I'm being loved into the life of God. I don't have to try to protect my little soul. And I don't know about you, but that's, that's like a full-time job. Have you noticed that? You almost say you need your own personal soul manager to keep you, you know, you know, you know just keep your image presented correctly and you to feel good about your image. You know, somebody, but instead you just come and we go, oh, you are, you know, you're, you're loved. I'm loved. I'm loved. I'm loved. So, Prayer for me, and we'll start practicing growing this, is literally experiencing justification, glorification, and love until I am convinced of the truth and stand free from the accusations and the fascinations that the evil, the evil one wants to send my way. And he loses his place over my life, and I begin to reign with Christ in a whole nother dimension. You don't have to get out of where you are to feel better. Good news. You don't have to change your location to have a new future. You don't have to get married or not married. You don't have to do anything to come into fulfillment. All fulfillment is in Christ. You don't have to have someone recognize you to be recognized. Jesus already sees you. He knows who you are, where you are, and all we have to do is invite our, invite him into our life, and then practice taking advantage of all that we were received in his life. So, anybody like to try that? We'll just do a little open practice. All right, let's just take five minutes and we'll just practice. I'll bring you into my little, my, my secret life. Dear Father, we are <clears throat> forever grateful for what you have given us in Christ Jesus. And I want to see it all. I want to touch it, taste it. I want to experience. I know there's so much of Jesus that's poised to break into the earth. <laughs> 
but you'll do it through your living church. It's not about a church being rejected or thrown asunder. It's about a church being washed with the water of the word, presented faultless, without blame, and irreproachable in your presence in love. Mm. So would you do the work today, Holy Spirit, that you've been given to glorification and to love and to justification? So say this with me. Say, Father, in Jesus, in his resurrection, which I believe in, I am justified. Everything that I ever did wrong has been remitted, forgiven, removed. It does not have say over my life. I am free. I'm justified. I'm a son, daughter. I'm accepted in the beloved. Now take a moment and just breathe that in. Doesn't matter what anyone else thinks of you. People could still look at you and go, ooh. God looks at you and goes, ah. Hmm. Smiles. Acceptance. Nobody can bring a charge against us because we've been justified. Now let's continue. Father, I thank you that in Jesus Christ, I am glorified. I have a future, an inheritance, a purpose given before time began that cannot be lost or stolen or taken by someone else. I have an inheritance given to me in Christ Jesus and I cannot be condemned. So I step out of all condemnation, no hopelessness and despair, and all the emotions associated with that. And I smile into the future. You are able to perform your promises. You are able to glorify me into the image of Jesus Christ fully satisfied. I have a good inheritance. I have a good future. I am in Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. Take a moment. Receive. Take a moment. Take a moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so good when you start touching this. He starts touching us. He awakens. You see, everything's already known. Therefore, it can come alive so quickly. Now let's, lastly, but f completely, the completeness of this whole thing. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you that nothing can separate me from your love that you have in Christ Jesus. Because I'm in Christ Jesus and I receive his love. I receive your love. I receive overcoming love. And I declare every lie of separation give way. Give way. I am accepted. I am loved. I am received. Oh, now let love come. 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 Confidence. Trust rest, valuation, importance. Right in the middle of the trials we're going through, right in the midst of the testing that we're being put, placed in, because God's planning to unlock love bombs in us. And all of a sudden, what was tormenting us, we become the tormentor of the tormentors. We become the liberators of the people that are tormenting us. We come alive in the love. No condemnation, no judgment. Ooh! Receive. There's more. There's so much love. I don't know about you, but I've been in a love def deficit too, too long. I want to just be loved. You're not loved in your marriage? Let him love you right now in your marriage. 
You're not loved in your business, let him love you in your business. Not appreciated at home, let him appreciate you in his house. Come on. He is the lover of our soul. He is a liberator. He is a free. Yes. He drives out all fear. Are you afraid of the future? He is in the future. Ha ha ha. Shabo. And he's there with love. Looking with love toward us. Yes God. Yes God. Let it be Lord. Let it be Lord. Mm. Mm. From this past place of love, you'll find that love then begins to emanate into your daily life. You can look at things differently, look at people differently, look at circumstances differently. Because love now defines it. Love covers the multitude of sins. Who? Yes, Lord. Just receive one more for a couple moments. Take this love. Love suffers long and is kind. God is suffering long with us, kind toward us. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. God does not parade himself and demand us to, you know, it's gentle, kind, merciful, loving, living. Receive his love. We are loved in Christ, loved by Christ, loved by Father in Christ. The love that God has, he chose us in him before time began to be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, Holy Spirit, as we go into our day, I pray that you would come right now and seal us where our faith has come alive in Christ. Seal us. Seal us in this truth that we have come to have faith in right now. So that, Holy Spirit, you become the, the trainer, the coach. You collect us and bring us back here until it becomes a place of residency that we're comfortable and we know it to be true. A place of justification in Christ, glorification in Christ, love in Christ. In the name of Jesus, seal us, Holy Spirit, so that we can access all of this again just by accessing you. Whew. Now feel the Holy Spirit because he is present all the time. He never leaves us or forsakes us. He therefore is constant, omniscient, omnip omnipotent, he is present. He knows everything. He is here. And just ask him, Holy Spirit, help me return here as soon as I lose my place. Let me grow a home here. Let me build a place of communion so that I can be a well-loved son and then love well. Hmm. Holy Spirit, I'm just lead this... I feel the Lord saying, for the next 30 days, he is in a love. He intentionally wants to love us. Each of us individually, and then begin to affect us corporately. He wants to just love us. He wants it to be experiential. It says in Romans, 1 John 4, 16, we know the love that God has for us and believe. We know and believe. It's, it's a growing experiential faith moment. So I'm going to receive that. And I want to, really, I want to receive that. I'm, dear Heavenly Father, I receive that you, by your Holy Spirit, are saying to us, and I stand in the front of the line, that you want to fill the love de deficit. You want to bring a baptism of love and fill us with love and affect us by love until the love of God is not just the place of our identity, but the place from which we love from and we love with. And your love starts to flow from us, from our abundance of the love we're receiving from you. So, Lord, I thank you for that right now. I put my hand in heaven and receive the love of God into my heart. I extend my other hand out and let that love start to flow wherever you want it to go. 
But Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do it for Jubilee. Do it for the Church of Jesus Christ in Southern California. Do it for sons and daughters everywhere. Come find them. Love them. Pursue them. Overwhelm them in love. Wow, there, there you go. Pull that in. That's yours. That's yours. That's yours. Pull that in. Lord, seal us again now with this new promise. Let it grow up in the next 30 days. Let it be remarkable, the testimonies that we will give of what God did in his loving us so, so wonderfully and so completely in Jesus' name. Amen. I think we're done.